Yeah, morning church. Uh, as uh, Pastor Jono uh, introduced me, uh, I'm Elder Kenny. Um, my first name is not Elder and last name Kenny. So, so just, just putting it out there. Uh, and yeah, I get the lovely privilege of serving uh, in this congregation. I get the lovely privilege of loving and serving a lot of you in different capacities, whether it's through aesthetics or through a family group um, and in some instances uh, through um, through the preaching of the word now some of you haven't seen me up here in quite a while I know some of you are very very excited um, so yeah um, the, the, the name is not Tiamo but uh, but more than that I I, I, I don't take this lightly. This is something that um, there's a lot of weight to it, and I'm very, very thankful for, for this opportunity and for this privilege. So with that, um, if you are coming here for the very first time or you have not been here in quite a while, uh, we are in the Psalms. We are in the mixtape. We've switched the tapes. Now we're on the other side of the, of the tape. And so Man, I don't know about you guys, uh, the Psalms have been very, very good. They've been very, very revealing. And so I'm not sure how many of you have left here feeling like, man, I'm, a, I'm looking at the Psalms very, very differently. Uh, because for, when I look at the Psalms, one of the things that comes out is, you know, um, your first thing is, man, this thing is very, very repetitive. The, the theme is the same. It's the same thing over and over again. Um, what new doctrines can I get? from the Psalms, but then I have to pause and remember that uh, a lot of our lives are really spent on having to remember things that we learned yesterday, the day before, and the week before, and last week. If I was to ask you guys, what did Pastor Ono preach on last week? Would you guys remember? You would. That is, fa that is fantastic. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, as we go through this Psalm as well, even though maybe this is something that you've heard before, uh, it's something that, uh, that resonates. So our psalm for this morning, we've kind of been hinting at it uh, through, um, through the songs. Um, it will be Psalm 63. And so this psalm right at the top, uh, it gives us context. It tells us that uh, this is a psalm of David while he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now, with this in mind, we just always have to remember that, you know, um, this, this headings were put there for us just to give us some context, just to help us to walk through the psalm and have some context. And so when we look at this psalm, um, the consensus of the way, which is uh, David was definitely in the desert or the wilderness, um, it, it's quite clear. The agreement is that we know where he was. Um, there's a difference of opinion, though, as to the when of the psalm. So when did David actually write this psalm? Some people land on that David probably penned this psalm during his time of persecution while he was on the run from Saul, which led him to the wilderness, to the desert place. We see this uh, in uh, 1 Samuel 23, uh, verse 14, where it reads as follows, David stayed in the wilderness strongholds, and in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. Saul searched for him every day, uh, but God did not hand David over to him. There's an Easter egg there. Uh, David, uh, sorry, God did not hand David over to him. I remember this Easter egg. It's going to appear later on again. So some land on that. This was during the rebellion of his son Absalom. So Absalom was basically baying for his blood, uh, which resulted in David once again fleeing uh, and rekindling his relationship with the wilderness. We see this in 2 Samuel 15, verses 13 to 18. And it says, then, informer, then an informer came to David and reported, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all the servants with him in Jerusalem, Get up, we have to flee, or we will not escape from Absalom. Live quickly, or he will overtake us quickly. Heap disaster on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. The king's servant said to the king, Whatever my lord the king decides, we are your servants. Then the king set out and his entire household followed him. But he left behind ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out and all the people followed him. They stopped at the last house 
while all his servants marched past him. Then all the Cheritites, the Pelotites, and the people of Gath, 600 men who came with him from there, marched past the king. So now, most of you, maybe the scholars here in the room are probably, you're itching, you're wondering, Kenny, which one is it? Uh, is it during um, Saul's persecution or is it during Absalom's rebellion? And I unfortunately, I'm very sorry if I've created an itch in you with something that you really want to know because I'm going to say to you that um, it actually doesn't really matter. And also on top of that, I actually, I don't know, right? I don't know which one it was. Did he write this uh, during the period of Saul's persecution or Absalom's rebellion. What I do know, though, is that David was in the wilderness in two separate occasions of his life, right? In these two separate occasions, this is, this is David, the young king who's just been anointed. Um, people would say maybe they put him around between 15 and 20 years. So that was the wilderness in his life. And then also later on, about 40 years later, this is now David Gray and Hayes, the veteran. Uh, he's seen many wars, and in both instances, um, this psalm would be applicable. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, the wilderness came to David in two separate occasions of his life. He could not prevent it, he could not run away from it. And so when we look at David from being uh, 15, 20 to maybe between 50, uh, 50 years and 60 years, uh, what we see is that by that period, David had a, probably amassed wealth, women, he had every pleasure, many victories. This is the warrior king David. This is the king uh, that everyone would aspire uh, to be. Uh, this is the king that inspired many. Uh, this is David who, when we look at the Bible, basically his name, his name appears more, more than any other name apart from Jesus Christ. And yet David could not run away from the reality of that. There will be wilderness times in your life. And so when we look at our own lives, we can, we can do everything that we, that we can. We can... We can have networks, then we can try and build our lives in such a way that uh, we can try to proof our lives from the wilderness. We can build wealth. We can go around the, the perfect circles of people. We can bring in the people that will build into our lives. We can do as much as we can. Our networks, our LinkedIn profiles uh, will not stop the wilderness from coming into our lives. There's nothing that we can do. And so, what we can do, however, is learn to posture ourselves in a way that helps us deal with the wilderness times in our lives. And so, even as I, as I speak about the wilderness, just for clarity, uh, when I'm talking about the wilderness here, I'm essentially talking about uh, challenging times in our lives. And so, this, this could be times that are, are due to maybe decisions that we've made or decisions that... Uh, we didn't make when we were supposed to make them. It could be even, it could be not decisions, anything that we have control over. It could be people that have made decisions that affect us. It could be people uh, in our lives, family, that basically are, are acting like unbelievers and we are the adults in the room and this is weighing heavily on us. It could be work situations that are stressful where you thought this was the perfect job but you found out like, I'm actually wor working for Satan. And you just want to run away from there. And so there's an awkward life, uh, laugh somewhere there where someone is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. So there could be a lot of reasons for being in this time, in this season. But one thing, one thing is for sure, it causes a lot of emotional, uh, spiritual turmoil. There's a lot of pressure. And all we want to do is just escape the season. All we want to do is just um, basically find ourselves in a space where we are no longer there. We're basically asking the Lord, Lord, where is my reprieve? I'm tired of being in this space. But one thing is for certain, no one wants to stay uh, in this time. And so with that intro, um, yeah, let's turn to Psalm 63 uh, for the morning. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, it's going to be up there. Um, 
And this is what David has for us. Um, Psalm 63. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you. In a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me as with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I follow close to you. Your right hand upholds, holds on to me. But those who intend to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. They will, give, they will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God, and all who swear by him will boast, for the, mouth, for the mouths of liars will be shut. And so before we go through the text, um, join me in prayer. Lord, um, first and foremost, we are thankful that we get to draw breath. We get to gather like this uh, with your people. We get to sit under your teaching, Lord. Uh, we are thankful for these uh, privileges. We are thankful that whatever space we're in, wherever we are on our journey, Lord, uh, that you are still who you say you are, Lord. Uh, you are still good. You are still gracious. Uh, you are still the one that we want, that we need in our lives, Lord. And so even as we sit under this teaching, Lord, convict us, convict our hearts, Lord. Uh, bring us back to the true source uh, of life. Uh, I pray that uh, as we are listening to this, Lord, even as I speak this, Lord, may, may there be a breath of life, Lord. And I pray for where uh, strength and energy is waning, Lord, may you restore it, Lord. I pray for where joy has been lost, Lord, may you restore it. I pray, Lord, for where there's brokenness, uh, where there's seeking of hope, where there's despair. Uh, may there be a remembrance, Lord, that all of these things you have dealt with. Our true life is found in you, Lord. And so I pray that these words have, they have that strength, they have that meaning of true life, Lord. And pray that they course through our veins and bring us back to life, Lord. All of this, Lord, we pray in your holy name. Amen. So, when we look at this psalm, what we're going to do is we, the broad outline of the psalm, very, very, it's very, very dense, got lots of information, but what I'm going to do is just to give us some guardrails, I'm going to split it into two parts, right? And so, these, these two parts will kind of like help us to understand the flow, but also just... Um, appreciate the structure and the flow of what what was happening in the psalm so uh, the first part will basically be uh, David's declaration and affirmation it's going to be very short but just because it's short uh, doesn't mean it's not important right and then we'll go into David's responses that will basically take up most of this morning and so as we do this, as we look at uh, verse 1, um, we see uh, David's declaration and affirmation. So, verse 1, David says, God, you are my God. And at a first glance, this, it's a very, very straightforward statement. But what we need to acknowledge is the gravity of the statement that David is making here, right? And to appreciate that gravity, we need to understand that when David is saying, God, you are my God, when we look at his life, uh, David is in the wilderness. David has been uprooted from all that is comfortable, from all that he's familiar with. More than likely, David is experiencing some form of emotional, mental, spiritual anguish. And yet, uh, David affirms that you, God, are my God. And so, here yeah, we may be thinking that, you know, David is, is telling God, he's trying to get brownie points that, God, you, you are my God. He's trying to convince God that, God, you are my God. But I believe, what, what I believe is that this is David's inner monologue, and we find it, we're finding it on paper. David is preaching to himself, and 
what we see here is that uh, da David's primary focus, right, and I use those words very carefully, primary focus isn't so much the current state of his life. The current state is that, man, he's in the wilderness. Um, he's, like I said, he's far from everything that he's familiar with. But his focus is rather his allegiance. And his allegiance is towards God. And so David is preaching to his inner self. He's recentering himself. He's reminding himself that Yahweh is his focal point. And all of us are preaching something to ourselves. Right? So when I, I was sharing, I, I often share this with our family group that one of the worst moments to find me in, or well, it's probably the morning, but only my wife can find me in the morning. But um, if you're driving with me, uh, it's such a test because I often um, respond, not necessarily to the drivers and what they're doing, but internally, I often find myself responding to the drivers through something that I'm carrying from somewhere else, right? And so I'm not going to say some of the things I say to people. You know, when someone cuts, cuts you off or wants to go in, then whatever it is that I'm carrying from before or whatever, whether it's a hectic work schedule or I'm having to pick up the kids, it's a hot day, having to go back to the office, all of it finds itself in the way I respond to other drivers. And so I've made it a point these days that, you know, as I'm driving, I, I preach to myself. And one of the things I preach to myself is say, I say, be kind, be kind, be kind, because everyone else is made in the image of God. And so even in that, we are all always preaching something to ourselves. Right? And so David's in a monologue. He's preaching to himself. He's saying, he's saying, God, you are my God. And so maybe... Maybe this is what all of us are preaching, but here's the thing. We, we can often fool ourselves, and we can preach this openly in public and say, yeah, man, God, you are my God, you know, for everyone to see. But the truth of the matter is that there'll be a season where this reveals itself publicly, and this will reveal itself publicly in how we respond to specific things, because whatever is the focal point in our lives, whatever it is that uh, we are affirming in our lives, whatever it is we are affirming in the secret place, if it is not God, it will reveal itself. It will reveal itself in our appetites. It will reveal itself in our pursuits, how we approach joy, sorrow, self-identity, uh, more so in a time of spiritual turmoil. Um, it will be revealed as to whether or not God really is our God. And so in declaring and affirming that God, Yahweh, the unseen, the immovable, the, un, the uncreated, the unshakable, that God is his uh, object of, of his affection, what David is saying is that this is where I will place my energy. And so how do we see this playing out in David's life? So we'll see a couple of key responses in the, in the number of verses that follow. And so I'm just going to name some that should be behind here when, uh, where they are highlighted. But we see key responses to this declaration. So David says that after he says that, God, you are my God, he says, I eagerly seek you. This is verse 1. Verse 2, he says, I gaze on you. Verse 3, he says, my lips glorify you. Verse 4, he says, so I will bless you. And verse 5, he says, my mouth will praise. And then verse 6, he says, I meditate on you. Verse 7, I will rejoice. And finally, verse 8, I will follow you. And this is what we see, that David is responding to what he said initially, which is, God, you are my God. And let's not be fooled. Even if we're not saying, God, you are my God, we are meditating, we are pursuing something, we are gazing at something, we are following something, we are rejoicing in something. So let's explore the first of these, uh, of uh, David's responses. And so David says, I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you, my body faints for you. And so this so david uses like very 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 emotive language in um in these verses he says eagerly thirst faint 
And so I'm not, I'm not trying to trash the English language. Um, thank God for the English language. It's what we use. If you go abroad, the first reference is the English language. But uh, in this instance, the way it's, it's dealt with the original language of, of seek, of eagerly seek, it doesn't quite carry the same amount of weight, the gravity of, of what is actually happening here. So the, if you're very interested, the, the word in the original language, it's shakha. shakha. I know I'm butchering that, but um, you have no way of spelling it and going back to check if I actually butchered it. But, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm entirely fine with that. But when, you, when we look at the, the English translations, you know, it's, uh, they're often, if you go across the translations, they will say, seek early, seek earnestly, look early or diligently. And I, 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 this is my opinion, but it doesn't quite carry uh, the desperation that is here uh, in this verse. So, for example, um, if we're to use the word eagerly seek, um, if I said, hey, man, um, my wife and I are going through so much. We've got so much tur turmoil, and I'm eagerly seeking reconciliation. Doesn't, doesn't quite carry, right? It doesn't carry the weight of the fact that I just said we're going through so much and then eagerly seeking. It's, I, I almost feel like eagerly seeking, there's a, there's a sense of like it's very mellowed out. But when you look at this root word and see in other places where it appears, we see it in uh, Job 8, verses 5 to 6, and it reads as follows. But if you earnestly seek God and ask the Almighty for mercy, if you, if you are pure and upright, then it will be, he will move even now on your behalf and restore the home where your righteousness dwells. And so when we see the way that it's used here in Job, there's matters of reconciliation here, there's matters of mercy, there's matters of purity. And these are all linked to seeking of God. We'll go further to Isaiah 26 verse 9, which says that, I long for you uh, in the night. Yes, my spirit within me diligently seeks you. Um, diligently seeks for you. For when your judgments are in the land, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Once again, we see the weight of this. This is speaking about righteousness. When we go to Hosea 5.15 as well, I will depart and return to my place until they recognize their guilt and seek my face. They will search for me in their distress. And so when we look at this, we can see that there is a sense of desperation in the way David is seeking uh, for God. David seeking for God has got life or death consequences. This isn't uh, he's seeking God as if God is a Sunday hobby. He's not seeking God as if God is a book on a is a book on a bookshelf that basically I'm looking for a book that can either inspire me or entertain me. When he looks at God, when he seeks after God, he's saying, "God, if I don't get you, I will die." Right, so even as we go further, we see for the rest of the verse, he says, I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. And so what David is saying is that if my need is not met, I will die. And that's the last time we felt this desperate for God. And that's the last time we felt like, if I don't get God, my life is done. And that's the last time we, we woke up in the morning and basically our first thing was that I need to commune with God. And that's the last time we came back from a very, very busy work day and our first impulse wasn't, I just need to relax, basically switch on the TV, go on to social media, and instead, we just said, I just need to commune with God because the world has been beating me. The world has been on my shoulders. I need to go commune with God because if I don't commune with God, uh, death is on my doorstep. When was the last time we felt like that? So as we move along, um, we see, um, we explore another of David's responses. 
And so what we see in verse 2 is that uh, David is gazing upon the Lord, and what he sees is God who is strong and who is glorious. And so verse 2 reads as follows, So I gaze on you in the sanctuary, I see your strength and your glory. Now, if we're being honest, it would have been very easy for David to look at his current circumstances and doubt God's strength. And we hear this all the time from skeptics. We hear this all the time from skeptics. They, they say that, man, if God is who he says he is, if your God is strong and mighty, why does the world look the way that it does? Right? And even here within the church, we are not exempt. We are not exempt. We go through very challenging times in our lives where we are seeking answers and we feel like there's this disconnect. We know we know that God is good, but man, we're like, I've got these challenges, these things are happening in my life, yet there is, there's a disconnect because on this one hand, I believe that you are strong, you are mighty, you are able, but I cannot connect the two. And so we end up in this thing of asking questions like, God, if you are strong and mighty, why am I still employed? If you are strong and mighty, Lord, why do we lose loved ones? If you are strong and mighty, why does injustice go unchecked? If you are strong and mighty, why, why, why? And the list is long. And so, the honest truth is that there are no easy answers to this. But at the core of this, I think most of us just want some form of reprieve. Right? A lot of us just want the season or whatever end to end. But I will attempt to answer some of these questions as to, man, if, uh, you know, the absurdity of the fact that, you know, we, we, we claim that God is strong, God is mighty, and yet on the one hand, it feels like, you know, God is unable. And there's, there, there's so many answers to this, but if, I think the first one that we also need to understand is that we live in a very broken world with very broken systems. And a broken world with broken systems will only produce more brokenness. And so for as long as we live this side of heaven, everything will be broken. Right? And the second thing is the fact that, um, in a way, um, I, I understand the whole idea of, you know, um, uh, people are performing acts of injustice, but all of us here, we have performed some form of injustice to another person. Uh, Pastor Ona preached on this last week. Uh, who's got clean hands? Who's got a pure heart? Uh, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? And it's none of us. And so when God, if God were to flex his strength, his power, it's against all of us. And so this is what brings in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ takes God's wrath on our behalf. You know, but there's so many more answers. If you want to hear more answers to this, you can come and chat to me after this. But we also have to understand that, man, we, we also have free will, right? And God doesn't take away that free will. And that's why as Christians, our thing is that with this free will that we have, our free will is to serve love and reflect who God is. Now going back, so what, what David does here, he realigns himself, he realigns himself by gazing on the Lord and not his current situation. And so what I'm not saying is that whatever your situation is, whatever it is that you're going through is not, is not important. And that's why I'm saying, you know, he realigns himself to what is primary in his life, and that is God. And so if we look at our own lives, our own lives are in constant state of flux, right? Our lives are constantly changing. You know, when, for some of you that are older, um, you went through university, you thought, man, let me get this qualification, let me get this degree, um, it will fix everything in my life. And then there were those that got another qualification, and then there were those that got another qualification. <laughs> and then they got another qualification and then you started working and you thought man this will fix everything and things just you just kept getting more things but you kept hitting the ceiling and that's the thing 
whatever we deme what whatever we we think um, we deem to be something that will give us control, will give us power, or will give us strength, over time it hits the ceiling and we find ourselves in the same space over and over again. And so for David, instead of hedging his life on what he had, and he had a lot, David says, I'm hedging my life on God. I'm gazing on God to see his strength, his power, his majesty, his glory, because with that, it never changes. Right? So with, when we look at God's strength, his power, his glory, it never changes. Whether or not there's anyone to witness it, before the world was created, it was there. Even after this, it will still be there. God's power does not increase or decrease based on our circumstances. And so David says, I will hedge my life on that rather. And so when we fix our gaze on anything else but God, we are met with the reality of a finiteness. Right? We are, we are met with the, with the reality of that man, I do not have control. Control is an illusion. But when we fix our gaze on God, uh, we realize a power and a strength that is beyond us. So even as we continue, so David sees this strength, he sees this power um, in verse 2. What does David do? Uh, does he ask for protection, which would be the logical conclusion? Nope, he doesn't ask for protection. Let's see what David does. So as we move to verse 6, uh, verses 3 and 4, uh, David is basically moved to a posture of praise. And this is remarkable. So David praises through, through his lips. He praises through his actions. And so verses 3 and 4 reads as follows. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. Uh, at your name, I will lift my hands. And I love this because sandwiched in between uh, this um, praising with the lips and praising uh, with his hands is God's steadfast love. And so he states that this, this, faithful, this faithful love uh, is, better, is better than life. And he's moved to praise. He's moved to praise. And so although God's love is better than life, David isn't saying that, you know, this, this, uh, my life is worthless, but it's almost like it's a very, very poor metaphor in that David is trying to find something in his life that is valuable and trying to give a picture of how amazing God's faithful love is. And what he finds is that, man, if I'm to look around, if I'm, if I'm to look for something that is valuable, uh, this life is valuable. Whatever I have is valuable. And he's saying that this very, very precious thing that I have, uh, this thing called life, God's love is better than it. But he's not saying it's worthless. He's just saying, man, God's love is beyond anything imaginable. And so what does he do with this life that he has? Uh, he uses the rest of his life to praise God. And he says here, your faithful love is better than life, so I will bless you as long as I live. And so the word that David uses here, this faithful love in the original language, this is hesed. And so hesed, it speaks of David's, oh, sorry, not David, of God's devotion. Uh, it speaks of God's kindness, his unwavering love, his loyal love. It speaks of his, his kindness, his goodness, his mercy, um, it speaks of the deep well of his love. So what I need is to understand that what David is speaking about here, this isn't a character trait or an attribute of God, right? This is who God is, right? In John 1 John verse 4, uh, when 1 John, John chapter 4 verse 8, uh, John says God is love. So when you look at this love, church, this is a love that we cannot, we cannot activate. It's not a love that we cannot earn. 
It's not a love that diminishes. It's not a love that fades over time. Uh, it's not a love that uh, you have to do something to earn it. <laughs> it's a love that is just there. It's just there. It's who God is. And so with that said, church, do you know this love? Uh, do I know this love? Do people look at us at our lowest moments uh, while we're experiencing emotional upheaval and say, man, I don't know what you're on, but I want some of that. Right? Or do people look at us in our lowest and think, where is your God? Right? I'll, I'll, give, I'll give this analogy. Um, uh, I think we, we all know that marriage is under attack and it has been under attack. And there, there's this whole idea going through social media of how marriage is a scam, right? And so first and foremost, um, marriage not created by man. Uh, marriage comes from God. Uh, it was his idea. Uh, it's his institution. And so done, done his way, marriage is not a scam, right? But the whole idea is that marriage is, marriage is a scam. Uh, don't go in there. It's a trap, right? And what, what I've loved to see over time is, you know, you meet, you meet people that have seen bad marriages, right? Um, people that are just, they, have, they basically have no reference point for, for a good marriage, right? And they basically come in. They say, man, I don't want marriage because of what I've seen. But they meet, they meet that couple that genuinely, they genuinely love each other. They genuinely enjoy each other. And so once they see that, there's this sense of like, man, maybe I've been having the wrong picture of marriage. And they basically start rewriting a false narrative on marriage. So my hope is that that's who we should be as Christians, that when people see us going through whatever it is that we're going through, when they're witnesses to our lives and they see how we respond to God, they would come to us and say, man, whatever God you're serving, whatever prayer you prayed, whatever God you have, copy and paste, I want that. I want, I want to experience that love. All right? And so... Yeah, this, 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 happens, this happens when we genuinely enjoy God, church. It happens when we genuinely enjoy God. And this, this takes us to our next verse. Um, and this is uh, verse 5. And so uh, David says, You satisfy me as with rich foods. Uh, the footnote to this is that uh, is, uh, on the rich foods is fat and fatness. And so other translations will say marrow and fatness. And so the marrow and fatness would have been, would have been almost considered like a, a, it's a luxury, it's a luxury food, hence the translations, some say rich foods. Uh, but in certain instances, um, in ritual sacrifices, this, these were portions that were set aside specifically for God uh, during the sacrifice. And so what David is basically saying here is that uh, when he engages in prayer and worship with God, he feels like he's dining with the king. And this king has not spared any expense. This, this king has basically given him the best of the best. David is not only fed, he's nourished. What is the difference? Fed, salad, nourish, steak. <laughs> I, I, I think I offended someone there. I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But going back to this, church, th this, this is key because um, when you adopt a posture of praise and worship, whatever season we're in, um, it, nourishes, it nourishes us because our posture is towards God. 
And so I know that the wilderness tends to provide us with many reasons to be in a state of despair. Um, often uh, we have feelings of hopelessness. We have uh, feelings of just, um, of just not wanting to be there. There are many reasons not to enjoy God. And they are and all, I get them. They make sense. But we are hit with a problem here because we end, up, we end up basically praising God based on our situations, right? Our praise and worship is generated from our current circumstances instead of God's character and nature. And how many times have we seen this where people basically say, hey, um, I'm going through a lot right now. My relationship with God is not in the correct place. So I'm basically going to draw back from church. I'm going to draw back from God, All right? And often what this is doing, it's, it's really revealing uh, that our worship of God is just basically based on our circumstances and not who God is. And so, in all honesty, I believe that one of the reasons we struggle with enjoying God, um, with engaging in praise and worship during times of turmoil, is because we either don't know God as well as we should, or we just don't know God at all. That, that is an honest truth. Um, that is true for me. It is true for everyone else here. The reason why we struggle to enjoy God in tough times is because we don't know God or we don't know God as well as we should. And when I say know God, please understand me. Uh, I'm not talking about what Pastor Ones said last week, uh, a one line or what you heard on a podcast somewhere. I'm talking about really getting into the details, your own uh, personal time, where if I was to say, man, what, what, are you, what are you learning from God or where are you with God today? You can give an answer. You can say, man, I'm communing with God. I feel like, man, I'm dining with the king. Right? This isn't based on something that, um, something that someone told you or it's secondhand information. This is your own experience. If I was to ask you, man, when was the last time you experienced God's favor, God's goodness? When was the last time you prayed for something and God came through? When was the last time you prayed? You know? So that's the no that I'm talking about. And what I love about uh, David's responses here, if you have not seen, but David's responses are directed to a person. Uh, they are personal, right? So as we look at, as we go back, uh, as we go back, backtrack to verse, back, verse 2, and we'll go all the way to verse 8, we can see when David says, I gaze on you, uh, he says, I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory says, my lips will glorify you because of your faithful love. And he says, you satisfy me. And he says, you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. These ideas of your strength, your glory, your faithful love, you satisfied. You are my helper. You are my protector. This is an indication that, that David knows who God is. Do we know God like this? Or do we know God in terms of um, a classroom learning? That these are the attributes of God. We can list them. But if we're to basically take all these attributes and match them to our lives and say, when was the last time I felt protection from God? When was the last time I felt satisfaction from God? When was the last time I felt God as a helper? We'll have to look back to maybe a couple of years back. And not because God is absent, but maybe we don't know God. And so, you know, honestly, we, we can still pay lip service here in terms of um, our lives are coming together. Everything is beautiful. Uh, we can say along with David that, God, you are my God. But at once one piece is misaligned, once we are plunged into the wilderness, then our psalm, start to re our psalm really takes a different turn. Psalm 63 looks very different in our lives. Instead of God, you are my God, I eagerly seek you, uh, we end up with almost a Frankenstein um, of a psalm. We end up with a psalm that looks a, a lot more like this. Money, 
you are my God, I eagerly seek you. Comfort, you are my God, I eagerly seek you. Affirmation, you are my God, I eagerly seek you. Career, you are my God, I eagerly seek you. Sex, you are my God, I eagerly seek you. Insert whatever it is that is in your heart, in your mind right now. And we will pursue that thing. We will go to every length. We will say, I gaze on you in the sanctuary that I created. My affections, my resources, and my time will be dedicated to you. You satisfy and affirm me. I meditate on you with every opportunity that I get. And so often enough, these things will eventually come out. Our true pursuits, our true desires, our affections will show themselves because they will show themselves in how we're responding. And so this is a pitfall. Uh, this is a pitfall for everyone, for myself as well. And man, I'll, 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 I'll share a story. I wasn't intending to share the story. Um, it's going to start as a joke, and then I'm going to hit you very hard after that. I'm just warning you. <laughs> so, so my daughter asked me a question. She said, uh, very random, she says, uh, Daddy, what would you, what would you want most in life right now, right? And um, I said, I feel like she was setting me up, but anyways. Uh, and I said, uh, I would like more money, right? Um, more money, I think, is a good thing. Um, and then... I'm not sure if I asked her the question or she volunteered, but then she's like, I would like to go to heaven, <laughs> right? And so, so it got me thinking, uh, I'm happy we raised her really well um, <laughs> so, so far. Um, but it got me thinking as to what's happening in my heart, right? what is preoccupying my mind right now. If I was to read this psalm, it would sound something like, Money, um, you are my God, I eagerly seek you. And at the core of it, it's, we'd like a second car, uh, we'd like a bigger house, uh, we'd like, 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 right? And because of those things, then we're driven to this thing where, you know, um, we find ourselves basically putting something in the center and it starts defining us. And now I'm looking for jobs that will pay me more money. I'm looking for things. And all of these things are not bad things, right? They're not bad things. And I love this quote from, from John Piper uh, from his book, Hunger for God. And he says, the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil. So the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when they replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. Church, this is, for the middle class community, this is, this is our pitfall, that we will, we will have these things that are competing with God side by side, but more often than not, the truth of the matter is, uh, the things that are taking over our lives are the things with regards to our comfort, the things that relate to uh, our, uh, our going further in careers, uh, our families, and all these things. And those things are not bad, but often what we want from those things is what we want from God. And whatever it is that they're giving, only God can give to us in all pureness. And so as we move along, in the next portion, in the next verses, verses 6 to 7, uh, David's response here is to meditate, rejoice, and cling to the Lord. And so verses 6, 7, and 8 reads as follows. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches. Because you are my helper, I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. And so David's reference point for meditating and rejoicing in God is the fact that God is both his helper and protector. And so this is, I mean, the, the, if we're being honest, there's been a sense of like absurdity in David's responses. It's like, God, you are my strength. You are, you are glorious, but you're in the wilderness. 
God, you satisfy me with all the rich foods, but you're in the wilderness and you probably have very little. And this is very much like it. Uh, God, you are my protector, you are my helper. And yet, David, you're in the wilderness, right? You were driven to the wilderness. Not only uh, were you driven to the wilderness, you are still in the wilderness, right? So how is God your helper and your protector when this is the situation in your life? And I'll, I'll try to make sense of this from our story in 2018. If you've been here long enough, you will remember this story. Uh, basically, in 2018, what happened is that um, everything that could have happened happened in that year in a very short space of time and then extended a period of time, but basically, at the beginning of the year, um, a, a work contract was promised. It never came. We thought it was going to be another month, um, another another week or so, and it just never came, right? So basically, we we're a family that had zero income. And then within a space of about a week or so, um, my mom was in an accident, uh, nearly fatal, and basically, she, would, she was basically in hospital for almost three to four months. In that very same space, um, we had the joy of hearing that we were pregnant and we were excited. And later, we would basically find out that, no, this is not going to happen. And we suffered a miscarriage. And so all of this is happening within almost one month. And what, what we realized in that period of time is that it would get worse it would get worse, right? And one of the things that, that basically marked our lives in that time, in that season, was that all, all of these things are happening, right? We basically asking our community, our friends, to basically support a middle-class family for us to be able to keep our home steady. We basically had to move to a different place. We had to move to Pulukwane, uh, for a season because my mom was in, was in hospital there and lots more other things. And so the easiest thing that would have come out from that is like, God, I, I was promised a work contract. It didn't come, right? So we don't have an income. God, um, we've heard stories of, you know, people have pregnancies and there were all these symptoms, but they still gave birth and everything was fine. God, um, why did my mom get, getting into an, get into an accident? Um, she's very old. You know, this is very unfair. All of these things could have been on the back of our minds, and it, it makes sense. But what we did is we adopted this posture of, man, we need to take a step back. And, and hear me out. What I'm not saying is that it's the whole look for the silver lining in the cloud. All of these things were terrible. They were very, very terrible. There were times where we felt abandoned by God. But once we step back, we're like, man, it is actually a great thing that I am an unemployed and we don't have an income. Because what did it do? It allowed flexibility in our lives. So basically, we're driving between two cities. We're driving between Pretoria and Polokwane because I could be there for my mom. All right? And then in the same breath, man, my mom's injuries were really bad that the district hospital couldn't take care of it, so they had to take it to Pulugwane. I was thankful for that, because what did it mean? It meant that I was basically 10 minutes away from her because my in-laws stay in Pulugwane. And I could tell you more and more stories of just how things came together, that even though in the midst of all of that, uh, there were things that were bad, but man, God took care of us. And so how does, that, how does this relate to David? Right, so when you look at David, uh, David is David does, is not reducing his protection or God helping him to one single event. Right, he's not reducing it to one single event, which is that I'm in the wilderness. But David looks at the greater scheme of things at at the at the bigger spectrum, and he's saying, "Man, for first and foremost, man, God, my life has not been given over to either Saul or Absalom." right? I'm still alive. I'm still drawing breath, right? I'm still protected even though I'm out in the wilderness, even though I've been uprooted to a different space. God, you are still with me. And so for us, it's, it's to basically look at God, take a step back, 
and basically realize that, man, there's so much more that God is doing in and around us beyond one single event. Because here's the thing, if we're to basically define God's protection, God's helping us, or even God's anything down to one single event, we have a very, very perverted view of God. Right? But if we to take a step back and look at everything in, in context, then we see that, no, God is active. Right? And so when you look at, when you continue with this, um, we look at verse 8, and man, I was, uh, I was wowed by verse 8. I love verse 8 because I uh, basically only saw this yesterday. Uh, I was moved, but David says in verse 8, I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. And so David says, God, I follow close to you. I cl- other translations will say, God, I cling to you. But the line that follows shows that David's clinging on to God isn't dependent on him. Right? Uh, his very next line is basically, God, uh, you hold on to me with your right hand. And so David holding on to God does not depend on his strength. Uh, it does not depend on his ability. It does not depend on how long David could hold on to, but it depends on God. And when he says, God, you're holding on to me, he uses this term, this phrase, the right hand. And so every time this, this, this phrase has been used, it speaks of God's power. It speaks of his authority. It speaks of his honor. And God is holding on to me. He will not let him go. And so if you feel abandoned, here's the comfort. Um, you holding on to God is not dependent on your strength or how far you can go. Uh, it's dependent on Him. Can you imagine those those relationships where, you know, the relationship can only go as long as you're basically putting something in, right? But this is not that relationship. It's the opposite of that. And just some wisdom in that. Um, if you are in that relationship, uh, I'm sorry. It's not a nice. It's not a nice thing. It's just some wisdom from me. You are probably doing it to someone else as well. So that that is just to put things into context. But um, as we continue on, yeah, the good news this morning is that man, God, God sees you. God cares. Uh, even if your strength is failing, um, God will not let go. So as we move towards the end of the psalm, we see that uh, God isn't a God who's just content with only receiving praise and worship, but he's a God that cares about every inch of our lives because all that I've done so far, or at least all that the psalm has done is just, we, we've seen this very almost hyper, hyper-Christian, hyper hyper-worshipper, uh, from David, where David is basically going through everything in life, and yet his response is, God, I will glorify you, God. I will praise you, God. I will do this. I will do this. And most of us are probably still thinking, man, isn't, isn't there an ounce of honesty of like, man, what is happening in my life? And we see this in the next verses. So as we read verses 9, 10, 11, we see, but those who intend to destroy my life will go into the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the power of the sword. They will become a meal for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by him will boast, for the mouths of liars will be shut. And so what David is doing here is that David has basically recognized that, man, um, uh, God, God is not just a God who's just like, who just says, bring your praise, bring your worship. And as soon as you bring your sorrows and your despair, God is like, man, uh, I didn't sign up for that. I just want the praise and worship, but God cares. And so he can bring this to him. He can bring his sorrows. He can bring his confessions. He can bring his experiences in the wilderness. Basically, David, as in Psalm 13, he can say, uh, Lord, how long, Lord? How long will things remain this way? And the truth of the matter is that a healthy relationship with God is characterized by a balance of worship and lament. Right, those those two go together. There's a whole book written about uh, about lamenting. It's called Lamentations, and basically, if you open it, they are lamenting. 
Mm, how's that for honesty? I, I just this is I think this is what I love about this is what I love about the scriptures that man, um, they don't have this ethereal view of the human of the human um, of the human experience. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, of the human experience it's a very real experience that we're very real people with real everyday experiences and you know when we go into the scriptures we see people much like us people who lived much like us they had the same issues they basically struggled through the same issues and that's why as we go through the scriptures man we can find ourselves in here and god recognizes that all right and so I honestly feel, though, that one of the reasons that we, we know that we can approach God, right? We know that God, yes, you will listen to me, but I think we have reservations on approaching God because often enough, I think we, we have the struggle of how God will respond or if he will respond at all. And often it's a, it's a thing about expectations, right? It's a thing about, you know, this is what I'm expecting. This is what I need in life. If I bring it to God, God might basically do the reverse of it. And so often what tends to happen is that our expectations, our wisdom goes to war with God's wisdom and God's expectations. And so I'm sorry if this will, this will probably hurt, but uh, this is the equivalent of my eight-year-old basically asking Guys, don't tell my eight-year-old that I'm using her as, as a reference. But my, my eight-year-old asked me, uh, Daddy, when are we getting a second car? So I said, hey, uh, we can't really afford one right now. He said, oh, but we can. Uh, we just bought McDonald's. <laughs> All right? And so, so, often, so often, if you haven't put things together, when we go to war, with God's wisdom, when our own wisdom, our own ideas of how life should be, and we take that to God, um, this is what we sound like, right? This is what we sound like. And so when we look at David, uh, David moves to a space of trust, right? So David basically expresses confidence in God that, God, even though I don't know what your plans are, what you want to do, I will trust in you, right? I'm still in this space of the wilderness, but the truth of the matter is that you know better than I do. And so we see this where he says, but the king will rejoice in God, and all who swear by him will boast, for the mouth of liars will be shut. And so David had plenty of opportunities to basically um, do things his, his own way. He had plenty of opportunities to basically... Um, take justice into his own hands. Uh, it's quite a remarkable story when you look at the way David referred to Saul and even the way he referred to Absalom. Many a times with Saul, he would basically refrain. He would say that, I will not lay a hand on the one that God has anointed. And that was his constant theme that this man is chasing after me and yet I will not do this. And you need to remember that, that David still had a small army, right? He still had people with him, so he could have done something. It was the same thing with Absalom as well. With Absalom, he even said to his general, he said, don't lay a hand on him. Be kind to him. How remarkable is that? And so what David is saying is, man, I'm going to put my confidence on God to deal with this on my behalf. I will trust in the Lord. And so basically David adopts a posture of praise and worship in the wilderness. And out of this, there's an outpouring, there's an outpouring of trust and confidence in God. And so David's praise and adoration of God, it didn't change his circumstances, right? But it helped to cultivate, to cultivate trust and confidence in the Lord. And a lot of us need to hear this this morning is that while, while the prayer of how long, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, uh, is a prayer that God gladly ac accepts, I think we also need to be asking God, like, God, what are you cultivating in me in this season? What is it that you're working on in me right now? Maybe there's something that needs to be purged in my heart, things that I'm holding on to in this time, in this season. God, may you reveal to me what it is uh, that you're working on. 
And so I love this this quote from Trusting God in the Wilderness. Um, it's from Ted Wiesty, and he says, On a foundational level, God always provides what is truly needed to live a life of dependence. So let that sink in for a moment. How often do our ideas of provision have more to do with living in such a way that we are independent and self-sufficient as opposed to vulnerable and dependent on God. I'm going to read that again. How often do our ideas of provision have more to do with living in such a way that we are independent and self-sufficient as opposed to vulnerable and dependent on God? How many of us are praying that prayer that God... Uh, put me in a space where I'm dependent and vulnerable to you as opposed to God give me more stuff so that I can basically establish my own dependence my own independence my own self-sufficiency and I think a lot of the time uh, at least for me a lot of the things that I want they're for my own comfort uh, they're for my own security and it's a very dangerous prayer guys It's a very dangerous prayer. God, put me in a space of vulnerability. Put me in a space where I'm dependent on you. But that's where true life is. That's where true life is. And so when we look at the book of Job, Job goes through through everything imaginable. And so he wants answers answers from God. And God responds to, to Job and gives him all the answers, not necessarily the answers that Job uh, thought that he thought that he wanted, but uh, God gives him the gives him the answers that he needs. And Job's reply right at the end is this: I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, "Who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance?" Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. You said, "Listen now, and I will speak." When I question you, you will inform me. And this is the pinnacle. I've heard report I'd heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. And so my hope for all of us is that God will cultivate a deeper knowledge of him in our wilderness time. And like Job, we would say at the end, I'd heard about you, but now I've seen you. And so even as the the band comes up as we close. Maybe, maybe this, this hasn't quite, quite hit home and it, it feels very, very heavy. And maybe you're in a space where you still feel like, man, um, this does not provide me the hope that I need. You've just heaped coals onto my shoulders. But I just want to say, man, there's Jesus. There's Jesus Christ. Uh, not all of this has to be on you. If you feel like, man, I cannot enjoy God in the season that I'm in, remember there is Jesus. Uh, There is Jesus. You can call on him. And what I love about the story of Jesus Christ is the fact that, um, you know, John, John the Baptist sees, uh, sees Jesus Christ and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus gets baptized. You guys know the story. What's the first thing that Jesus does when he gets baptized? The Holy Spirit takes him to the wilderness. And so for all our lives, for all of us, the wilderness is something that comes to us. We have no control over it. We cannot do anything about it. And yet Jesus steps onto the scene and what does he do? He confronts the wilderness. And so Jesus does that with our lives. He comes to confront our sin. He comes to confront our brokenness. And what we know about Jesus' time in the wilderness is that once he's in the wilderness, he basically does what Israel couldn't do in their 40 years in the wilderness. He does in 40 days, 40 nights. He wins the battle. He wins the battle against temptation. And in that, that is one of the one of one of the many battles that Jesus would basically win. And so, take heart, Christian. And if your heart is in a space right now of just despair and hopelessness, take heart that Jesus Christ has already won the battle. 
he's he basically when he arrives on the scene his very very first battle scene is basically one of defeating satan and we know what he would do on the cross and so this is a jesus that basically is familiar with the wilderness this is a jesus that you can take your prayers to him it's not a jesus that basically when you take your prayers to him he says i don't know how to deal with this but much like us he's been in the very same space and the difference being that jesus has been victorious and so church whatever it is whatever is weighing you heavily whatever it is that you brought in here my prayer is that you would know that jesus has taken care of it let's pray lord um we're thankful that we we're in a space where we get to look back to your perfected work that we trust in what has been and what will be lord uh, we are thankful that uh, the wilderness has no power over us, Lord. We are thankful that um, the work that you've done on the cross, Lord, uh, speaks to us now. Uh, that whatever it is that we're going through, Lord, um, you have dealt with sufficiently, Lord. I pray for each and every person that's in here, Lord. I pray for whatever it is that they brought in here, Lord, that uh, you've removed uh, the weight of the shoulders. I pray for people that have come here feeling shackled, that you've removed those shackles from them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that there's a reminder that regardless of what we're going through, the spaces that we've gone into, Lord, whether it is by our own making or basically the people around us, Lord, uh, that, Lord, you are there with us that you will hold on to us, Lord, that you will never let us go, that we are not dependent on what we can do. We're not dependent on our own competencies, Lord, but we are depending on you, Lord. That competence is an understatement that, God, you have secured victory, not for our lives now, but for eternity. And so, Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor, whatever season, whatever time we are in, Lord. Lord, reveal to us the things in our hearts that we're holding on to, uh, the things that are hindering us from getting deeper with you, getting to know you better, Lord. Open up our eyes, Lord. And like Job, we can say, Lord, I had heard about you, but now I have seen you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen.